welcome to another edition of Theorycraft. I'm Ben, that's Jack, and our very little friend Boris Johnson, keeping us slightly insane, not much but enough. During this very pandemic times, as well as normality as a whole. We are two dudes and a furry little guy that like to discuss all things sci-fi, comic booky, or just nerdiness in between. And we just rant and rave and ramble all things TV series, movies, or just general ideas. So, welcome. Welcome one and all to the land of utter nonsense. Welcome, welcome, welcome to my crib. <laughs> yes, welcome to my world. This week... We are discussing the upcoming Thor movie for possibly 2022 or maybe 2021 at the earliest, Thor Love and Thunder. Not a lot has actually been released in terms of what is actually happening in the movie so far. We've got some confirmation in terms of actors. Obviously, there's going to be Chris Hemsworth because he's Thor. You're going to have Natalie Portman, which for whatever reason has come back as Jane Foster, despite the fact that she's done bugger all, absolute bugger all. But we've also got Christian Bale playing a very obscure character, but a very interesting character nonetheless, that was in the recent Thor comics, well, possibly two, three years ago, called Gore. Now, Gore is an alien, I don't know what race he is, but he essentially was on a world that was dying. It was basically at its absolute cataclysmic point in time. Most of the race had died from either the planet itself or just because they were dying out. But Gore was quite a deeply religious guy and believed in the gods and thought that they would come along and save him and the rest of his race because that's what you do when you believe in a certain deity. As he tries to make his way through to try and find the gods to try and save him and his family, one by one his family's killed off by random cataclysmic events, which would be disheartening, but his faith stays strong because it is what it is. Along the way, he then finds two gods warring between the two of them, and that makes him go completely bonkers, flip his lid, and basically say, like, what the hell are you doing? You're supposed to be protecting us, but you're busy fighting over yourselves while our home world is destroyed. So, in his instincts, he decides to take one of their weapons and slay them both. Now, I don't know whether or not that's going to be anything close to what we get for the next movie. But the really cool thing about this special weapon, the All Black Necro Sword, is incredibly important to the rest of the Marvel Universe because it ties into Venom. Yes, for some odd reason, Venom is linked to an almighty weapon known as the Necro Sword, which was forged by the old, well, probably the most powerful evil That's... being in all of Marvel, Null. So which was the symbiote god, right? Pretty much, yes. He was the only creature in existence before anything existed in Marvel Comics. The Celestials, the big robotic beings that you see in Guardians of the Galaxy, created the universe, he didn't like that, killed one of them, and then he uses his own dark essence to forge the sword and then forge the symbiotes. And then it ends up going along the lines of that. Now, from what I've heard in terms of what Love and Thunder is going to happen, supposedly Jane Foster is going to be a future version of Thor. Right. But I don't really see the justification for it. Like in the comics where she became female Thor, it made sense. She had been a long-staying character, Thor. It, it, she was a pivotal character. She had such a big story arc and a very tragic story, but she had a really interesting story nonetheless. For the MCU, she's been pathetically boring. <laughs> like, Indeed. <laughs> You could get a sponge with googly eyes and it would have more acting premise than her. 
Yowch, Ben. Yowch. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, like, it's just obviously on this show, we speculate quite a lot. So if we just spitball ideas back and forth. And a lot of times we end up creating more in the middle of this. So this is going to be completely on the fly if you're watching this. But yeah, yes. with this sort of thing, with I knew Christian Bale was... Um, was he? All, I can't remember if he was always going to play Gorg because I swear that's a different character to what we found out last time when we decided to speak about Thor: Love and Thunder. Because there was speculation he was going to play another big baddie in Thor. Yeah, I mean there was a lot of speculation as to who he was playing because the only information at the time was that it was going to be a CGI character, and the only other slightly cgi character that was a thor baddie at first but then obviously became a good guy was beta ray bill which is one yes. of the very few characters originally that was uh worthy enough of lifting mjolnir boris believes he is worthy of mjolnir ekkiohemer boris what well, yeah, well, okay, you can't have me all there, but here, have, my, have Daddy's hairbrush. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Anyway, um, but no, I mean, the thing is, it's all been speculation so far for what this film's going to be. I, I was hoping for Beta Ray Bill because it would have been nice to have the idea that there was going to be like establishing more of what Thor's abilities are. But ever since Ragnarok, obviously, we know that the hammer doesn't really mean anything because the power comes from Thor himself. Yeah, but then does that completely negate the whole purpose and everything of Mjolnir? <sighs> yeah. Well, the whole point of both Mjolnir and Stormbreaker is the fact that it was a way of channeling his energy through it because he can use it, as we saw in Ragnarok, but it's a bit all over the place. It's like it's kind of like wearing glasses in a sense that like you can still see to a degree without them on, but it helps to have them on to be able to focus where you want to look. Yeah. But the other thing as well is obviously Loki is supposed to be turning up in that film because it's going to be the Loki from the TV series that somehow winds up in modern day. I think that's going to be, I think, I think I've seen a few sort of, Leaked images of both Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston uh, to get them like together, and seen a few leaked images from that, from which I'm assuming is from uh, either the series or from the film, but most likely from the film. Mm -hmm. So, like going from there, if it's going to be, I'm imagining it's going to be a very, probably a very nice marketing scheme. I don't think any of us would complain, but we might see. Uh, if we're going to need a bit more sort of explanation into the whole nitpicky details like we do here, then it probably leads some more eyes to go in to watch the uh, Loki series and vice versa. Because maybe you may find some things which are not in Loki, which you have to watch four for, some things which you have to watch Loki, which are not in four, you know? Mm. I mean, the funny thing I've, well, the thing that I find funniest is that. The only reason why Thor's getting a fourth movie is just down to the fact that his trilogy so far hasn't been spectacular enough to be just a trilogy. No, because obviously, like, number one, uh, two, we can forget about completely. <laughs> I think the third movie saved itself because it was just, it was taking the mick out of its own character. It knew it was a goofy character. It knew it was... An alien. That was what was missing, I think, from the majority of the previous two Thor movies was how obscure the concept of Thor is. Because yeah. the other thing I said to you is I, I wish they hadn't skimmed over the idea of the Donald Blake concept. That in the original comics where Thor had a human persona that he transformed into and vice versa, it would have been more intriguing to have kept that to a degree because they've recently brought him back in the Marvel comics. The, yeah, the actual true. Donald... Well, the Donald, Con the, the Donald Blake persona was locked away for years because Thor never transformed back. It was like, I think it's been like 10, maybe 15 years since he's transformed. But the problem is, is that when they do switch places, they go to like a paradise dimension that Odin created. 
But because of being locked away for so long, Donald Blake went insane like for too long because it was just he was self aware eventually. Yeah. So when Thor decides to switch, you end up getting this completely shit crazy version of Donald Blake that literally slaughters Loki and all the Asgardians within five seconds of being on Asgard. Yeah. It's like, but he's human. Like, how the hell is someone that's just human able to do all of that? Um. But yeah, the other thing as well is I do hope they do stick to the general gist of Gore being that he has the weapon that's linked to the symbiote because we've been wondering for a very long time how the hell to intertwine Venom to the rest of the MCU when it does happen. Because well, obviously it will happen eventually one way or another, but it's trying to find a way of doing it. Well, to be honest, they are. I think they may be... I hope they don't go the route of the Easter egg with this one going, oh, it's just an Easter egg, you know, that relates to Venom. As I don't think that's going to be enough. As, no. from, as like, obviously, we know Venom is a separate standalone film by itself right now. It's not connected to anything. It's its own standalone film. But obviously, eventually down the line, we're going to have to try and connect it to Spider-Man, as obviously yeah. you can't have Spider-Man without Venom and vice versa. So going from that, especially... The kind of the really screwy bit is originally the symbiote found Peter Parker first, but instead in this one it found Brock. So yeah. this is one problem we're going to have to try and maybe theorise on and fix, but with the sword, I can imagine how that's going to link it, but then obviously it's going to create a lot more problems because then you've got to figure out how you're going to introduce Spidey to Venom after this. Yeah, I mean, I theorise with you that they could perhaps do it in the way that Spidey originally got the Venom symbiote in the comics, where there was Battle World, which was created by the Beyonder, because it was basically an amalgamation of different time and places throughout the multiverse that got merged into one planet. The Beyonder basically wanted everyone to fight against each other, and it was basically a way of Marvel rebranding characters and creating new merch. That was the whole point of the Battle World story. Yes. But the thing is as well is that it does make sense to bring in that big concept of a story because for the longest time now, a lot of us fans have found out that there's going to be two sides to the MCU, that there's going to be the cosmic side and then there's going to be the down-to-earth side. Supposedly, Doctor Doom is going to be the, like, down-to-earth villain, which would make sense to intermingle with the cosmic side eventually because he was a key player for the Battleworld story. He basically tricked the Beyonder and ended up getting his abilities and just doing what he wanted with it. And obviously the spacey side, we're going we're gonna to have to have Galactus, surely, aren't we? Oh, God, I would love to see Galactus. We wanted Galactus for a very long time, ever since the piss poor version we've had so far <sighs> but it's it's one of those things where how do we justify it without it being too over complicated because... how, how do you mean which part there's lots of parts to get through <laughs> Well, the idea of Galactus is that he is basically, he was a guy from a previous universe. He came to the Marvel universe as reborn and basically had to devour worlds to sustain his life. But uh, I don't know. I don't think you can tie that into Venom specifically because the, the, like the whole story of like the home planet and everything, which was referenced by the Venom character, the symbiote. And then, but can you connect that to Null, maybe? This is difficult. I don't know. I mean, the cosmic side of Marvel is probably the most complicated thing to try and interweave with everything else, because other than Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't think we've had much in the way of, well, Guardians and Captain Marvel. Yeah. That's it. That's... Uh, yeah, gone is uh, like obviously we had a bit of Infinity War and so on and Endgame, but that doesn't necessarily count. No, I mean the thing is with that it was like it was crossing between the two, but in terms of like doing its own separate thing, 
it was just literally Captain Marvel and Guardians that you had one and two. But even that, they barely touched the surface on what the gut, like the whole cosmic side of Marvel is. Yeah. I mean, you could technically introduce Galactus into Captain Marvel 2, perhaps, because of the fact that she introduced the scrolls. You get introduced to Galactus originally with the scrolls because he basically invades their home world, and that's how it all like starts from there. Scrolls, I, I, I do love that word now on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> um. But again, it's it's trying to fit everything in. This is the biggest issue because I can imagine the MCU wants to try and top itself from what they've done with Endgame because it if they'd have said that they wanted to end the MCU at Endgame, it would have been fine. Like it was a farewell, whatever tour. Like, oh, yeah, it was, I mean, it there, obviously there's some things we could speculate and change, but apart from that, I wouldn't really necessarily change anything. I think. The end of that we got, I can live with, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But, but I still, but I still think Hulk is a scroll. Just saying. Oh, yeah, <laughs> this is our namesake for this channel: is that we still believe that Hulk is not Hulk; he is a scroll in disguise. Nobody can convince us otherwise. <laughs> but. Hopefully, with Thor, Love and Thunder, we can get a bit more of an understanding of the bigger scope of the cosmic side of things, because there was an easter egg to beat Bait Rui Bill in Ragnarok. He was one of the champion's heads in Sakaar. But yeah. again, that would have been a, like a really great potential moment to have him in, and they just forget. Because the thing is, there's, other than Captain America... I don't think there's been anyone else in the MCU so far that's actually lifted Thor's hammer. Hella Cat caught it, and so did Odin, but that doesn't prove the point. Uh, no, not exactly. <laughs> it's just... It's a very odd one to try and figure out where we can fit everything else in. Well, when you are mentioning the Beyonder, mm-hmm. obviously... I think there's potential low of the Beyonder, which I think is a very, for me, a very underused character, personally, I think. But also, yeah. another way, like I said to you a few nights ago, or was it last night? I can't remember. But a way you can connect, like the Beyonder and so on, if you're going to go to more, some more spacey, sort of mystical side of things. You Also, the Beyonder is a connection to Madam Web. Madam Web's yeah. a connection to Spidey. So maybe that could be, the Beyonder could be a possible way which you can intertwine them together, possibly. Yeah, I mean... But then, obviously, we're getting the whole sort of multiversal Spider-Man thing, which I am racking my brain on how they're going to do it, which I'm hoping that they do it well, right, but do it well, because otherwise it's going to be a cluster fudge. <laughs> I think I think the main focus for the MCU is that it's going to be a very multiversal thing because it would have been good if they actually introduced it in the previous Spidey film, but obviously they just did it as a way as it being a con. But given yeah. the fact that you've got Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, you've got WandaVision, which is a pocket universe, and you've got the Spidey film that's going to cross like dimensions... <laughs> It is going to slowly build into the idea of the alternate realities or whatever. But again, it's trying to figure out how it's all going to intermingle without it being too over I, the top. I see potential of how like the whole multiversal thing is going to work. So you're going to get a load of really cool stories in that. Mm-hmm. A lot of really cool, a lot of really cool different issues. Maybe things such as I uh, don't know about Secret Wars, but other obviously other option of stories, but. With the multiverse of Spider-Man, that's the one I'm kind of looking forward to the most because obviously, I think Tobey Maguire is confirmed. Yeah, uh, is Andrew Garfield? Andrew Garfield's confirmed. We've also got the actor that played as Doc Ock confirmed. Oh yeah, Alfred Molina. Yeah, and um, we've also got uh, we got Electro and yeah. Jamie Fox. And supposedly there's been talks, but no confirmation yet, of Green Goblin 
the original guy. Oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> but the thing we both said is, like, how are they going to bring them back when they technically died? Ah, uh, this is the thing. I don't. You're not going to have it any other way if maybe, unless you have Madam Web in the Beyonder or either. I am not sure, but I think for this one, I think you're going to have to introduce Ma I think they're going to, I honestly think they might try and introduce Madam Web into this film. I mean, supposedly there is a Madam Web solo movie, whether it's an MCU, what, MCU movie or whether it's meant to be an animation one. I got high hopes of it being MCU. Excuse me. But I really do hope they have Michelle Pfeiffer as Madame Webb because she's got the very thin, very serious face because she was very good as the evil queen from, oh, what was it she played? Um, Huntsman. Snow and White and the Huntsman. And she oddly looks like Madame Webb as well. Yes, yeah, she does. I mean... <sighs> It's just very odd to sort of figure out how much they could change her character because from what we remember from when we were kids, Madame Webb was just a very random clairvoyant character that just like sat on a random throne and watched everybody. Yeah, but, it was very yeah, very sarcastic bitch. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. She was like the American version of Anne Robinson from Weaker's Link. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are the weakest part of that. Description. But the thing as well is that Madame Webb was linked into the comics later on and she became a bit more of a pivotal role that she was like a spider woman. But if that's the case, what other spider-themed people would you want to see? Because... <sighs> I have this feeling that they could bring back the idea of Emma Stone being Spider-Gwen because, obviously, ever since Emma Stone was Gwen Stacy, they made her character more interesting, which ended up creating the whole alternate reality thing of Spider-Gwen. Well, here's the thing. Here's how I reckon that they might do it. Uh, I'm not sure. This is just a theory I came up with. And the reason how I think they're going to do it is referenced from one of my favorite episodes. I can't remember the episode's name, but it's the episode, if anybody else remembers, if you like from your childhood, from Fox Kids, uh, the episode where Madam Web manages to conjure up uh, different Spider Men from alternate universes. Yeah. Remember? I yeah, I got a feeling that was called Battle World, but I could be entirely wrong. Yeah, I think so. I mean, with that. I'm not sure if it may be leaning into the idea of that these are just completely maybe different sort of Earths or universes with these, like the same, there's the same catalyst which involves them obviously all being Spider-Man, Peter Parker and so on, which they lead off into their stories and everything. The only difficulty which I've got with that, the thing which is really bugging me, how are you going to explain why they look different? Because obviously what, Tobey Maguire doesn't look like Andrew Garfield, and Andrew Garfield doesn't like Tom Holland, vice versa. So, and they're different ages. So, how on earth are you going to explain that one to me? That's the bit I struggle with. How are you going to explain that? Unless, are you going to have maybe an older Tobey Maguire where he's got a beard and he's all grey? You know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there has been people speculating how he's going to look, whether he's going to be a lot a lot more of a dishevelled version of Spidey. I mean, the thing is as well, is there has been some rumours that supposedly Tobey Maguire is obviously his own Spider-Man, the one that we saw first, but also him in the MCU is meant to be Uncle Ben. If that makes sense. Yeah, I know, but oh. So. You understand why this is bugging me so much? I mean, it's all well and good saying alternate timelines, but the but, thing is with all that is it's trying to comprehend it as easy as possible for those who don't understand the simplest forms of time travel. Exactly. <sighs> I thought I was thinking maybe they can get away with it slightly by doing maybe 
sort of like a Ben Riley kind of story, but not have Ben Riley in it, obviously, but maybe some kind of a clone, and maybe is, like that's why they look different. But then, if it's going to be alternate timelines, it should all they should all look the same, and it should all be from one alternate timeline. That's pretty much how it works. So it should only be one actor. So this is the bit which I really, really, really struggle with. But I suppose maybe. Could you rationalise that it's alternate timelines? And obviously, these are the different actors that we've had. It, well, obviously, Tobey Maguire was the one that we first grew up with, you know, because we are from that generation from 2002. And this is the Spider-Man we grew up with. But I'm wondering, would maybe uh, the MCU and everything maybe forgiven for fans just accepting that these are just alternate timelines of Spider-Man, despite them looking different, and maybe we'll just accept that as fans. I think I'm not that's, sure. I think that's the easiest way to go about it. But there's one thing that I was going through the other day, because I was wa watching some clips from that movie, I wanted to have a refresher, is that J. Jonah Jameson does reference Doctor Strange in Tobey Maguire's first Spidey film, because he doesn't know what to call him. Oh yeah, Gwen. And he like, goes that Doctor Strange is already taken. Yeah, because and also you know that actor who came was coming up with the names and like Joe Joe J. J. Joe Jameson was going crap crap crap. Yeah, and then like yeah and the, yeah because that guy is actually Sam Raimi's brother. <sighs> okay. Yeah, it, well, just a little just a little tidbit. It's not to do with this, but just a little tidbit of info. But um, yeah, with that being already taken, um. Every time I think back to that, I was like, huh, how are, we, how are they going to do this now? <laughs> like, if there's always little Easter eggs, which if when we go back and we watch our favourite films from ages ago, from years ago, the early 2000s, now there's Easter eggs flying around left, right and centre that we're only just mm. discovering now, which I don't think they intended at the time, but we're only just discovering because they're linked. Yeah, but the thing is as well is with Doctor Strange, his main thing is that it's the Eye of Agamotto, which has been redesigned to be the Time Stone for the MCU. I would imagine that the way that it could have come across is the fact that Doctor Strange has travelled all these alternate timelines because the Sanctum Santorum is in its own little bubble of a sort of thing. Like it it kind of acts like Doctor Who's TARDIS in a sense, that it shifts between dimensions and space and time as well. I've just come up with a little bit of a theory and idea uh, mm -hmm. just now in my head. I'm wondering, now this is only just one idea because obviously it doesn't kind of explain Andrew Garfield, but I was wondering, what if, if Tobey Maguire, in, if they, obviously they're, they're going to meet in this story, no matter what. They're going to meet. The three Spider-Men are going to meet somewhere. But I'm wondering if maybe Tobey Maguire might possibly be in some way an older version of Tom Holland Spidey, maybe? I know it's a bit head-screwy, but... <laughs> It's just fun to spitball these ideas. I'm just... It would be quite an interesting one, but... I know, yeah, because I know like, we were all clamouring for wanting to have a multiversal Spider-Man to see all three actors back in the role. And then when we finally got what we wanted, we went, oh, crap, how's this going to work? <laughs> I mean, it could kind of work, but then what would be the justification for him coming back? Would it That's... be to try and undo his identity being revealed? Because oh, that's maybe. the only... And like, I can't imagine... I know, obviously, like the antithesis of him becoming Spider-Man was because of Uncle Ben, but I can't really think of that as a good enough reason for the story. I can't think of that as a good enough reason. I mean, that would be too much of a big butterfly effect moment, because otherwise you probably wouldn't have any Spidey whatsoever. Exactly, and maybe that would impact maybe the other two Spider-Men, maybe? Oh, this is such a head-screwy thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is... The, la the last we saw for MCU Spidey is that, obviously, he got outed by Mysterio. I'm sure he's still alive. Like, I am damn sure he's still alive. He's just found a way of hiding till he can 
come back and do something worse. Yeah. But he's trying to figure out what goes from there in terms of the, the impact of him being outed as Spidey. Because obviously there's been talks of Charlie Cox coming back as Daredevil because he'd be the lawyer to Spidey, being the fact that they come from New York yeah. and being like a poor guy, like he's not going to be able to afford like a really, really good lawyer, which would then be able to tie in loosely to another old Spidey episode where you have Peter Parker with Matt Ooh. Murdock in court. Yeah, I see, I see where you're going now. But... <sighs> also, there's another problem as well, because Venom and Spidey are in the same city. Hmm. Yeah, you see what I mean? <laughs> I mean... Oh, God, this is a, such a kerfuffle. It really is. I know, I know. This is why I've been racking my brains going, right, we sorted this out. Now, here's another problem over here. <laughs> because the thing is, if Daredevil were to... That's going to be hell of a lot of people in one movie. I know this is good. Yeah, this is going to be like a five-hour-long film, <laughs> if that. But the thing is, as well, is the fact that it's literally just a character's movie. It's not like it's a big movie like Endgame was supposed to be, where it's everybody. But <sighs> yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is, what if Spidey's film kind of tied into Wonder Vision? Because she broke down the barriers between worlds by making her pocket dimension. That's why Doctor Strange sees her in his movie. So they're trying to repair the damage. But certain things do end up scattering through to the rest of the MCU. And that's how we end up getting the, the multiverse happening in different parts of the different movies. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I. Okay, yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah, I see that. I mean, it would be a hell of a push to try and get Venom from that as well. Uh, I, to be honest, I think until Venom Two is done, when we until Venom Two is done, when we got Carnage, I think as much as I would want it, but it'd be too busy. They, I don't think they can touch Venom at this point. No, no. The thing is with Venom is. It's somehow been a really good movie without the actual Spidey part. That's what's made it hardest of all. Yeah, because we, if you... cause remember before, we thought it was going to suffer because there was no Spidey in it, but it actually turned out freaking brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But he's trying to find a way of linking it to the rest of everything else. <sighs> yeah, cause I'm wondering... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've forgotten about something. Mm -hmm. Because I'm wondering, because Carnage, at the start of when he started causing Carnage, <laughs> sorry, it was just my little, uh, no, pun in, no pun intended, uh, but when like Venom obviously started effing stuff up, mm -hmm. he had a bit of an arc with Dormammu. Yes, he did. So I'm wondering maybe it could like could like Doctor Strange and Carnage maybe come into play together, possibly? That's another way you can do it. Cause I yeah, stop yeah, because no, not Doctor Strange. Carnage ended up doing a load of work for Dormammu. I can't remember what he was doing. Was he collecting life force energy? I can't remember. I can't remember either, but I mean it could work. But to what end? Yeah, I know. I'm just like I'm not just coming up. I'm just spitballing this idea. Um, I don't know. It's it's a very tricky one because the thing is, as well, is from what I remember in the whole like logistics of the symbiotes is that obviously for every spawn that happens they get stronger than their predecessor yes and unless i'm remembering wrong riot which is the main bad guy in the venom movie 
isn't meant to be like the hedge ha- head haunt show that Venom reports to. I think he's one of these many offsprings that's happened over the years. Who's that? Riot, the big bad guy, the big bad guy, the symbiote. Yeah, that was the issue that I had with the Venom film, is that they didn't really go through the whole self-replicating and the offspring thing. That was the bit which, that was the only thing really about Venom which bothered me so much. Mm. I mean, the designs of them look really cool, don't get me wrong, but they didn't fully explain in terms of like, how they work because they're literally these weird gooey creatures that split apart and i i thought they explained the whole thing that they bonded to a certain host well i thought they explained that relatively well and that they don't just bond with anybody i felt they did that very well with the symbiotes but with the whole self-replicating thing that's yet to be explored that maybe that will be explored a bit more when we get venom 2 with carnage possibly which I'm hoping, but then, I. But the bit which bothers me is that we had Venom at the start, then we had Carnage, and then I thought that the rest of the symbiotes was just what came after Carnage. So I was like, where does Riot and all the other symbiotes fit in? I don't know. That's I mean, the, that's the bit which really bugs me. The only way you could do it for Venom is say that at the beginning of his like next movie. He's been going like on a bit of a rampage, trying to be like a sort of anti-hero to a degree, because he's not a full-on good guy. Oh no, no, no! And it could be because it's like at the end of the movie, he bites the head off of like this goon in the shop, if you remember. Yeah. Or if it got to the point where like he's craving it so much that it's like pregnancy cravings. <laughs> Maybe. You see oh. what? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You're going with this like it's getting to the point where Eddie's losing control because it's like the biological impulses of the symbiotes is like it goes in like a stage where they have to feast so much to then unwillingly produce a new spawn. And then that's how Carnage comes along because obviously when Carnage came along the original comics, Venom wanted to try and kill it before it rose up and Spidey intervened. Yeah. So, you could have it so that Eddie's been trying to control Venom, but obviously Venom's been a bit temperamental. So the only way he can try and justify anything is by going back to the jail, where it's all like the death row inmates, like the worst of the worst scumbags, to try and feed on them instead. Ooh. So then it gets a bit more out of hand, and once he thinks everything calms down, there's a bit of like venom that sludges off and crawls off to Cassidy, and then you get carnage, literally. Okay, I actually quite like that idea. Yeah, because <laughs> obviously, what's the rating for Venom? I can't remember what the rating for the film was. I think it was PG thirteen. It wasn't R rated, but it was almost there. Like. It was quite dark in places, but it wasn't to the point where it was blood, blood and gore, but it was just very violent. Oh, yeah, but my God, like the film, absolutely brilliant. The mm-hmm. only a small little thing which I don't really like about the Venom film is obviously, no, I mean Venom 2. As soon as we saw the actor for Carnage, Woody Harrelson, that's just kind of when I went a bit meh. Just because I thought he was just a bit. Not saying he's not a good actor or anything, but I just thought he was a bit too old. You know? I think the thing that threw off me is that while he does look quite a good guy to be a very insane character, it's the fact that everyone knows he has no hair, so it's obvious it's a wig. I know, that's the bit which kind of... It almost looks like a, like, a cross between... If um, Bob Ross and Chucky had a kid... <laughs> <laughs> that... <laughs> Because like the hair looks like Bob Ross's hair, but then you've got the suit like this, like psychotic side of Chucky. Yeah, I see that. I mean, when I when I when I was in the cinema, I didn't know really anything about the film. I went to the cinema to go watch it, mm-hmm. and um, then I stuck up with them, like me and uh, obviously, but for you guys who are watching this, Ben has known my has known my 
wife, fiance for many years. I just call her the wife. And um, he's known her for many years. And obviously, we went to go watch this. We went to go watch this film. And I said, we need to hang around just for a little for a little bit longer after the credits because there's usually like an end credit scene with Marvel and so on. So we hung around after that. And then it cuts to, I um, can't remember what the bloody island's called. But anyway, it's just where the worst of the worst are locked up. And so Eddie Brock's going to go do an interview. And he sees somebody painting in, and he sees someone painting in what we can assume is blood. It looks like blood. And we see... Um, when I get out of here, it's going to be carnage. And he lifts his head up and it's Woody Harrelson. And I went, I wanted Jim Carrey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's oh, something island. Um, Staten Island. Oh. That's Staten Island? Yeah, I think that's the island in New York where you have like the inmates and stuff. Yeah. But... Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to intermingle with everything else, I find. Like, we'll have to wait and see. At the end of the day, there's only so much we can speculate, regardless. Oh, we can speculate till the cows come home, and we'll probably likely be wrong. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but is there anything else we want to wrap up before we go? I don't think so. I'm just looking forward to... If any of you guys have any suggestions of what the hell you think is going to happen, you probably might have a better idea than we do. But it doesn't matter how many ideas that we come up with, we will probably most likely be wrong. But... Merry Christmas. I hope Santa has got me the machete as self-defense from the football. <laughs> Anyway, I feel like, um, anyway, I feel like, hang on, I just feel like when it comes to all these different kind of things that we've got, like all theories and so on, it's going to be very hard to judge. We will likely be wrong, but I look forward to seeing like when the eventual multiverse Spider-Man is going to come out. Oh, do you, but do we have any kind of predictions on when? I think it's supposed to be 2022 at the earliest, because obviously, given what's going on lately, all filming has come down to snow snowball. But hey ho, it could be worse, folks. You could live in the UK. Oh God! <laughs> but yeah, thanks for joining us, folks. We're going to be taking a break for next week because it's Christmas, so you won't see us next week. But hopefully, the week after, it will be Jack's turn. Any ideas yet? I have none such as yet, but I've always got a whole list of ideas, which I've got. Might be another what if, it might be something along those lines, or if we get some interaction from you guys, maybe you guys can decide. But until then, we hope you, everybody, until we see you again, hope you have a very good Christmas and stay safe, stay healthy, and hope we have a better 2020 so you can expect a lot more from us in the new year. So... Stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon.